Welcome back to my channel guys, my name is Prince Lari and this is True Crime and Chill. Welcome, hi, if you are new here, this is True Crime and Chill, where I come to tell you about some of the most shocking crime cases that happened in South Africa. Some have happened recently, some have happened quite a long time ago. Some you may have heard of them, some you may have not. But if you want to keep hearing from me every week when I upload a video, please support my channel by pressing that subscribe button, liking the video, and also commenting down below what you think. Do you have any theories after the case? Do you think something else could have been done? Do you think this person deserved to get the sentence that they got? Or do you think something more could have been done to them? Any thought that you may have, I would very much appreciate it. If you, if you drop it down in the comment section below to show me some support, I would love to to hear from you guys but without any further ado let me not waste any more time and just go ahead and tell you about today's case so today's case is quite a messed up one as well because this one is going to be sensitive to maybe a lot of people who may see this at some point because i'm going to be talking about kids i'm going to be talking about kids because they are the victims in this video and like i said it's 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 a very sensitive video it's quite a messed up video and to think that things like this could really happen really would shock you but apparently there are people like this out there there are people who just do messed up stuff like this so that's the case that i have for you today so you better strap onto your seat because what i have for you is something that just may come out of a movie to be honest with you so this is the case of Norman Simmons. Norman was born in 1967 in January 12th, and he was born in the community of Cape Town, in the Malay community to be exact. And he was a teacher of grade five learners in a primary school in Beacon Valley and Mitchell's Plain. Norman was described to be an intelligent man who loved playing classical music, a man who knew about seven languages. And among these languages were Afrikaans, Hosa, as well as French. So that's how intelligent this guy was. He actually spoke fluent French. And you know, you think that someone like this, and it was actually said that he was also a respected member of the community. People knew him. People thought that this guy was a stand-up guy, you know, because of the kind of um, reputation he had also with kids because he taught kids at a, at a primary school. So you think that someone like this would actually be a model citizen would strive to be an inspiration to kids, but nope. Instead, he chooses to do some horrific acts to young boys in that community. So he was quite a wasted potential. That's what I describe this man as. He's just a wasted potential. Norman committed a series of crimes that involved young boys between the age of 9 and 13 years of age. You know, I seriously cannot imagine anyone doing any horrific act to a to a young child to a child i mean how could you seriously live with yourself knowing that you did something like this to kids and not only just one kid but about 21 kids were involved in this case 21 kids were victims of this guy so he he was really messed up he was seriously heartless and he was quite a psychopath if i had to be honest with you you know when i when i researched more into norman's history i found out that he had a brother who was killed in 1991 and Norman claimed that his brother used to sexually assault him when he was young. And the reason he grew up to be the kind of man he was, was because of this molestation that he suffered at the hands of his brother. And it, look, it gets even worse, okay? It gets even worse. He also said that the reason he murdered kids after sexually assaulting them was because he heard his brother's voice telling him to kill the kids the way he did. Most of Norman's victims were from the Malay community in Cape Town, and a lot of them were found in Mitchell's Plain, um, where they'd be found dead. And he did this from 1986 until 1994. So this is eight years of this guy doing this. He got away with this for eight years. He took the lives of about 21 boys after he sexually assaulted them and sodomized them. The way he would get his victims would be he would um, find them at a train station. He would wait for them at a train station. Hence, he was given the name of the station strangler. He would go to the train stations and try to see kids who are on their own, especially young boys. He had a thing for young boys. And what he would do is he would lure them away to wherever he could 
to wherever he can and then he would um, sexually assault them, sodomize them and then strangle them with a piece of their underwear, with the underwear or any other piece of clothing they may have and then he would just bury them in shallow graves with their hands tied behind their backs and then they would just be face down in those shallow graves. So like I said, Norman started his attacks in 1986, right? And his first victim was a boy by the name of Jonathan Clausen, who was 14 years old at that time. And his body was found near the Dam station in Belleville South. Then a year later, in 1987, a total of six bodies of young boys were found. The first body being 14-year-old Josef Hoffman's body, and he was also found, he was found in January of 1987. And then the second body was the body of Mario Thomas. He was found also in January of, the, of 1987. Then the third body of a boy who was found was unidentified. The boy was unidentified to this day. And he made it the third victim to be found in that year alone. The last three bodies that were found in 1987 were the bodies of a 12-year-old boy by the name of Freddie Cleves, and the other body that was found was one of 15-year-old Samuel Ngaba, and then the, the last body was the body of another unidentified 15-year-old boy, and they were all just found the same way, strangled, sexually assaulted, and lying face down with their hands tied behind their back, and they were found in shallow graves. And this was quite a horrific scene for officers and people of the public who started to know about these murders. 1988, only one body was found, and that was the body of Calvin Spire. And when Norman started to realize that, okay, now I'm getting a lot of heat, now people are starting to notice, now there's a lot of bodies piling up, he decided to take quite a long break because it was said that after the body of Calvin was found, um, there was a long pause, there was not a lot of activity that suggested that kids were being abducted and were being murdered. So Norman decided to go into hiding. He decided to lie low for four years because he came back again in, in 1992. And now in 1992, Norman was back to striking again because now the body of a 10-year-old boy by the name of Jacobos Lou was found in Nandi Beach. So Norman was back at it again. He was feeding his demons all over again because it was said that this guy was not only a murdering psychopath, he was a pedophile as well. And he mostly had, his, had a thing for young boys because whenever he would see a young boy, it would say that his, his hands would literally shake. That's how much he had such a, such a big lust for, for, ki for kids. And two years later in 1994, 11 bodies were found again. And now people in Cape Town were starting to get shocked, especially people who were in Mitchell's Plain, because they got to find out that a lot of these bodies were being discovered in Mitchell's Plain. And now that place was starting to be called the Station Stranglers Killing Spree Fields. So now people were starting to get aware of this. They were starting to be like, okay, now something really is happening here. A lot of bodies have been found in this area. And one body that was found was the body of an unidentified man. But I couldn't really find out if he was also related to the crimes committed by Norman. Because like I said, Norman had a thing for young boys. So it wasn't really said if he was also murdered by Norman Simmons. So yeah, there's a lot of bodies that have been, that were being found in Mitchell's plane, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to list down the names of the victims at the end of the video. So you can see how many victims this guy actually had. Um, so now the residents of the Cape Flats were starting to get... They were starting to panic. They were starting to get very frustrated and they were getting terrified of what was happening around them. Some parents were even refusing to let their kids go to school. And you cannot even blame them, if you had to be honest. You wouldn't be, you wouldn't be blaming them at that time because there was someone out there who was killing kids and this person had not been caught for a very long time. So they had every reason to panic. And what they started doing was they started to gather in groups to go around in Mitchell's Plain to try to search for this guy because they thought maybe they could find something in Mitchell's Plain that could lead them to finding out who this guy was or maybe they could find a clue that could lead them to the station strangler. So yeah, the parents wanted to take matters into their own hands. The members of the community wanted to take matters into their own hands. And the manhunt for the station strangler was recorded to be the biggest manhunt in South African criminal history. That's how much attention 
Norman was having at this moment. People were looking for this guy all over Cape Town. They were looking for him all over Mitchell's Plain. They were looking for him all over the Cape Flats, all over the Malay community. So he was a very, very popular guy. He was being hunted by almost every person, every parent, because people were getting worried about the safety of their kids. So because the amount of murders and kidnappings were still on the rise at that time, um, and these boys were still being found the same way, given suggestion that, okay, this is being done by the same person, there was a reward that was offered for 100,000 Rand for any information that could lead to the arrest of, of um, the, stra the station strangler. And as time went on, the reward ended up being increased to 250,000 Rand. So that's how bad things were getting. That's how bad people just kept on losing their kids to this guy. So something had to be done. Someone out there had to know something. So the rewards were put out for any information to just help the police catch this guy. So the more things kept getting out of control like this, the more kids kept on being abducted, sexually assaulted and murdered, the police ended up asking for the help of Interpol and FBI. And when they went to FBI, they went to go get the help of a retired FBI profiler by the name of Robert Gressler. And I have spoken about Robert before in one of my cases in the Moses Satola case. I will link it down below. If you haven't seen it, you should just go check out that video. It's, it's really, really interesting. So they went to go get the help of Robert Gressler. They wanted him to create a profile for this person so they can know exactly who they're looking for or they could have some sort of an idea of who, of who this guy could actually be. So Robert Russler came in and he did a psychological profile on the station strangler. And the conclusions that he came to was that the police are looking for a male between the ages of 25 and 30 and this is a guy who would probably be in a position of authority, someone who was sexually molested as a kid but someone who was also intelligent, smart, bilingual and this man um, probably had a thing for young boys and also he was homosexual so that's the profile that he gave out of the station strangler so you can really see how close he was to actually figuring out that this is Norman Simmons who kept on doing these things because Norman was in a position of authority he was a teacher he was homosexual because he kept on assaulting only young boys and he was bilingual, he knew seven languages, and he was described to be a smart and intelligent man, and he was also well-dressed. That's another thing that Wrestler added in his profile, that this guy could be well-presented, he could know how to dress himself really well. So that's the profile that was done about the Station Strangler. So once the police started studying Robert's, um, Robert's profiling of the Station Strangler, they started to realize that it went a lot in hand with the evidence or rather the information that they had gathered during their investigation. And once they looked at the sketch, they looked at the profile, it matched a lot. Like um, it matched Simmons in quite a lot of ways. And so because of this, they decided that Norman was the guy that they're looking for. Finally, in 1994, a boy by the name of Elroy van Ruyen was hanging out with his friends. They were playing at the arcade and then they were approached by a man and this man offered them money to help him carry some boxes to a place that was about 30 minutes away from where they were. So being kids, they thought, okay, this is, this is quite a great way of making extra money. They wanted to make some money. They decided to help this guy carry his boxes. But Elroy's uh, friend started getting a bit uneasy about the whole situation. He started feeling a little bit uncomfortable because he realized that a lot of these boxes were just empty boxes. So he started he started like being like, okay, maybe something could be wrong here. And he told Elroy, but Elroy didn't really take him into much consideration. And then it, so his friend walked back and he started just leaving Elroy there, which wasn't really much of a good idea, but he left. And then Elroy stayed behind with this man and then a week later, Elroy's body was found in Mitchell's plane as well. And when it was found, this is when Norman was arrested. He was convicted and arrested for the murder of Elroy van Royen because a lot of evidence that was gathered seemed to have pointed again that this was the station strangler who could have done this. 
But even though um, Norman was arrested for the murder of Elroy von Ruyen, he could not be convicted for the murders of the other boys who were killed over the past eight years. Because now, um, there wasn't a lot of evidence. It was said that there wasn't a lot of evidence to point that to him directly. But there was evidence that could have suggested that he was responsible for the kidnapping and the murder of Elroy von Ruyen. Remember I said that his profile was taken out and it was there was also a sketch of the man who could have done this. It was also released to the public. It was released to the media so that the public could try to see what kind of man the police are looking for. And this is how Norman got caught because a woman came forward and said that she saw Norman with Elroy at a station, at the train station, and she couldn't remember ever seeing the boy with this man ever at all because a lot of people knew each other in that community. So she found it strange that this was the first time she was seeing Elroy with this kind of man. And then when she looked at the sketch and the profile that was given by the police, she thought that this could be the guy that the police are looking for. And that's how Norman ended up being arrested for the murder and the kidnapping of Elroy. Now news was getting out that someone who murdered a young boy had been caught. And it was also put out that this guy could be responsible for the other murders of the other boys that were happening between 1986 and 1994. People were rising up together against Norman. People wanted justice to be served. A lot of people gathered up at the public gallery of the Cape Supreme Court to, you know, be involved in the trial of Norman and to try to make sure that, you know what, justice is served. It was said that there was about 40 or so people that were there. Among them were the families and, and friends of the victims as well. It was so amazing that these people who came to support the families didn't even know the victims. A lot of them just didn't know the victims. They only heard of them by name throughout the media, throughout the news. But they all came and they all came to show support and they all wanted justice to be served because what this guy had done was just absolutely horrific. So it was seriously amazing to see people standing up like this. It was so devastating to the public to learn that Norman was only going to be convicted for the murder of Elroy and not the murder of the other boys who were killed between 1986 and 1984. Because like I said earlier, there wasn't enough evidence to directly link him to the murders of the other boys. But the public kept a positive mindset that, you know what, if justice is going to be served for the murder of Elroy, then that justice will also be justice for the other boys who were murdered as well. So they decided to just keep up that positive mindset because in their minds, Norman was responsible for all of these murders. 1995, Norman was still in trial for the murder of Elroy and as this was happening, the police were still investigating his connection towards the other murders and kidnappings of other boys. So it was really good to see that the police were still taking this seriously. They didn't just say, okay, this guy is caught, case closed. They were still investigating to see if like, there could be something they could find that could link this guy to the murders of the other 20 boys. Because it was a total of 21 boys that were murdered in this case. And then what made it the 22nd victim was that unidentified man that I spoke about earlier. During the trial, Norman was just calm. He was calm. He was not phased. He was basically in a state of serenity. And this, this, this made people really frustrated and it made them a little bit more suspicious of him. And when he spoke about this, he said that he was in a state of calmness because of his faith in the Lord. That's what he said in his own words. That he had faith in the Lord and he knew that God had his back. And when I read about this, I'm like, what the hell is it with serial killers and being so twisted? Like it's like it's like he thinks that what he did is somehow justified or, or it's somehow okay for him to do anything like this. So he doesn't have to feel remorseful or he doesn't have to fear or worry about anything. That's just how sick and twisted he was. A lot of people thought that Norman abused his status as a teacher. And if you think about it, it really makes a lot of sense because like I said, he taught kids who were in grade five at that time. So people thought that, thought that he abused his status and he used it in a way that um, he wouldn't be suspected. And that's what I think is what it makes a lot of sense. 
Maybe he thought that, you know, since he was known as a teacher in the community, people would not suspect what he was doing if they happened to see him with one of his victims before he got to sexually assault and kill them as well. So I think, I also think that he did. I think he did um, abuse his status as a teacher. Maybe he used it to cover his, his tracks as well. But luckily when it came to Elroy, um, he was caught, okay? He was actually witnessed by, by the woman that I spoke about. And I know that I didn't mention her name before. Her name was Fazia Hercules. So he was seen by Fazia and then Fazia came forth to the police and then she ended up testifying against Simmons in court. So yeah, even though he may have gotten away with what he did for so long, for eight years, finally he was actually caught and justice was going to be served. Because um, Fazia Hercules was the only person who could directly link Norman to the disappearance of, of Elroy, the case against Norman heavily relied on what she saw. And this was a year later after she had seen Norman with Elroy. And because of this, Norman's lawyer took advantage of this by cross-examining Fazia and questioning her reliability and the reliability of her details since it was from a year ago. So things were seeming a little bit like um, Norman might get away with this because if you think about it, a lot of people wouldn't, wouldn't remember things that happened from a year ago. So the, def the defense was starting to take advantage of this and it almost seemed like hope would be lost. About a week into the trial, what happened was a cross-examination was done of the statements that Norman gave to the police and the statements that he made in court. During his cross-examination, um, his lawyer accused one of the investigating officer for arresting, he accused him of arresting um, Norman without any grain of evidence against him. And he claimed that Norman was arrested because the police were just looking for anyone at that point to arrest because they were under the pressure from the public to make an arrest. Like someone had to be caught, someone had to be convicted and the police just decided to pin this entire thing on Norman, even though there wasn't any evidence or that much evidence to suggest that Norman is the one who was responsible for all these murders. So when Norman was arrested, there were a lot of um, anti-station strangler vigilante gangs that were formed in Cape Town. And even before he was arrested, there were people who were trying to find this guy. They wanted to find him and so they wanted to do something to him and because of this um that's why the lawyer started saying that the police felt the pressure of the public because people wanted to take the law into their own hands so when they finally caught someone they thought the public would finally be at ease that someone is finally caught the person who was responsible for this will finally be arrested because th these gangs were ready okay people were ready to finally put this guy to an end. And like I said before, the public had already made up in their minds that Norman was the one who was responsible for these murders. And because of that, Norman was receiving a lot of threats to his life. People were talking about how much they are going to kill him. A lot of people were saying that they were going to kill him dead. But as time went on, um, Norman ended up being convicted again for the murder of another boy by the name of Donovan Swartz. So this was the second charge that was put on him. So it was not only Elroy's charge anymore, but it was also Donovan's charge. And because of this, there was starting to be a little bit of hope that justice was going to be served this time and that this guy was going to be put in jail for hopefully the rest of his life. As the case kept on going, during the case of Elroy, it was said that that case was starting to put up enough evidence to suggest that Norman could be responsible for the murders of the other 21 boys and that one unidentified man. So now there was starting to be some hope and some light in the case. But when Norman ended up making bail, the threats on his life kept on continuing. People were still after him. People still wanted to make him pay for what he did. And because of this, he went to the court and he appealed that he should be put in protective custody. And even though this was very unusual of the court to do, it was granted and he was put in protective custody for his own life because people were starting to talk about how much they are going to kill this guy for what he did. And you could not blame them because a lot of boys had been killed at that time 
and obviously people would be frustrated they would you know want to find something or find someone to blame for all of this and when they saw that norman was the person who did this when he got out on bail they said they are going to kill him but although um, norman only ended up being convicted for the murders of donovan swartz and elroy van ruyen he was officially classified as the serial killer who was responsible for the murder of the other um, of all 22 victims who were involved in this case and because of this he was also dubbed as the station strangler and he ended up serving a sentence of life sentence in prison and he's still serving it to this day even though he tried to appeal to the sentence um, for quite a number of time during the years but he was denied and so yeah guys that's the case of the station strangler aka norman simmons and i want to know what you guys think about the case i want to know what you think about norman because what i can say about him is he was seriously twisted he was very sick and the fact that he tried to pin this on his older brother sexually assaulting him and being in his head telling him to kill kids still doesn't make it right and i just think that you know people like this I don't know. I don't know what we should do with them. I don't know what should be done with them. But it's very, very sickening to think that there are people out there who look at kids and they have sexual thoughts for kids. You know, and Norman was one of these people. And what's worse about this, what's worse about what he did was not only did he sexually assault them, he killed them as well. 22 people is a lot. 22 people, 22 lives taken just like that that is that's an evil heartless act and so that's what i think about the case but tell me what you think down below in the comment section and if you did enjoy the case please do show me some support by subscribing to the channel if you haven't like the video and also comment down below what you think and i will be looking out for you guys' comments and i will see you guys next week have a have a great one